For the Yale Cancer Center, I want to welcome um, those attending as well as my participants here uh, for the ASH update on lymphoma. Um, so my name is Scott Huntington, a lymphoma clinician, as well as a health services researcher. And I'm joined with uh, Dr. Kathari, who'll be focusing on aggressive B-cell malignancies and um, mantle cell lymphoma, as well as Dr. Tarshin Sethi, who will present some updates on Hodgkin lymphoma and T-cell lymphomas. Uh, Dr. Foss will be joining us towards the end uh, to help lead the uh, question and answer uh, discussion. So I, I know many have been focused on uh, COVID and would love to look forward into the future, but in terms of indolent lymphomas and CLL, uh, my slides are actually going to be mostly focused on, on how to um, kind of navigate our patients uh, through the COVID era with indolent lymphomas. These are my disclosures. And when we think about approaching CLL and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, given the uncertainty that we are facing with the COVID pandemic, there's a few takeaways of historical data that really um, come to fore forefront of my mind when approaching a patient. And that's that the improvement in progression-free survival um, infrequently has translated to overall survival benefits for patients receiving first-line treatment for indolent lymphomas. Very different from my colleagues that will be talking about DLBCL and mantle cell and uh, Hodgkin, but in this uh, situation where CLL and indolent lymphoma, this um, kind of association has been seen uh, frequently. And there were some updates um, showing that here at ASH. This was Dr. Wojak who presented the update on the Alliance study. Um, and this was a randomized, uh, a randomized study comparing bendamustin rituximab to a brutinib model therapy or brutinib rituximab. And uh, this was an important study that really led to uh, the use of frontline abrutinib for many of our patients. And that was based off of a really pro uh, progression-free survival benefit, both in the uh, model therapy arm as well as the abrutinib rituximab arm. Both had a hazard ratio of uh, 0.36. And the updated median follow-up of 55 months, that PFS benefit was, was, uh, remained to be quite uh, impressive. Um, Dr. Wojak did a very nice job in terms of presenting um, updated PFS stratified by uh, risk factors in CLL, but she also had this slide here, which was overall survival. And so at a median follow-up of 55 months, the overall survival uh, between the three arms was really identical. And it's important to note that the follow-up uh, for this analysis was uh, locked at um, April 2020, kind of right before the pandemic. And so having both this data, as well as the um, a corresponding ECOG study that was FCR versus a brutinib um will be, I think, important in terms of overall survival and how we address our patients. When we think about indolent uh, Hodgkin lymphomas, often follicular lymphoma and the use of maintenance um, is a uh, hot topic. And this uh, is just um, some, a little bit dated data now of follicular lymphoma maintenance rituximab following our chemo. Um, this was a randomized study, PRIMA study, and this is the data at 10 years. And what we see is that um, adding maintenance rituximab for two years uh, certainly improves uh, progression-free survival, time to next treatment, uh, time to uh, delay of cytotoxic chemotherapy. Um, in pretty stark differences, 10.5 years of median um, PFS compared to uh, 4.1 for those without maintenance. But again, the overall survival in this patient population at nine years um, was identical. So why do we think about that as we move forward? Is that our patients with inmortal lymphomas um, usually uh, live for, for years, often well over a decade. And if there's a new potential uh, downside or new pandemic that might uh, impact their long-term survival, um, a focus, of, I think, of our management uh, needs to be uh, addressed in that, in that situation. And so most of the data on uh, concerns of uh, differential impact on COVID in our patients has been mostly data from CLL. This was very nice work from the French Innovative Leukemia Organization uh, from Dr. Bakassian. And what they looked at was um, just over 500 patients uh, treated uh, in 17 French groups in, uh, with CLL. And um, they presented the antibody response to two vaccines of uh, mRNA COVID uh, vaccinations. And what we see uh, is about 70% of patients that were treatment naive uh, mounted an antibody response compared to 60% that were um, uh, treated prior but off therapy at the time of their vaccination. And that compared um, pretty favorable compared to the on treatments. So only 22% of patients that received um, on treatment uh, vaccination mounted antibody response after two doses. When you look at what those therapies were, 
uh, the vast majority of patients were on VTK, continuous VTK. And in those patients, just 22% of patients uh, mounted an antibody response after two vaccinations. If you were on venetoclax monotherapy, it was about 50%. And if you were on venetoclax along with either anti-CD20 or VTK inhibitor, there uh, was really uh, very minimal or no response uh, in terms of humoral response to do two vaccinations. Now, you might think that we've moved beyond two vaccinations. We've done three, we've done four here in the United States for many of our patients. Um, this data did look at patients that had no response to two uh, vaccinations that then went on to get a third. And just about a quarter of patients um, will, will respond to a third dose. And again, most of those responses were seen in the treatment naive CLL or those that were off treatment. Uh, if you were on therapy, um, you had only about a 25% chance of mounting antibody response to uh, three doses of vaccine. So that data really goes nicely with what's been um, reported at smaller institution studies here in the United States have been published in the last year. What we really didn't have is a lot of data in under, other indolent lymphomas. And so this was very nice data from uh, Dr. Beaton from Australia that presented um, data looking at Waldenstrom's patients as well as follicular lymphoma patients in Australia. So smaller study, uh, only about 34 patients with follicular, 37 with Waldenstrom's, about a third of patients had um, been treatment naive. Um, many of those um, in follicular had had immunochemotherapy, including some that had uh, just completed treatment uh, a, a few uh, months previously. Uh, BTK was quite common in the Waldenstrom's group and fairly representative po population uh, for our patients with follicular and Waldenstrom's. Not only did they have antibody uh, titers, but they also did some neutralization assays. I'm not gonna present that data, but really there was strong correlation. So uh, antibody titers and neutralization correlated quite well. Um, and they also had some T cell assays that I'll present at the end. This is just the antibody titers for patients that had immunochemotherapy compared to um, treatment naive, compared to healthy controls. And really the treatment naive, whether you had Waldenstrom's or follicular lymphoma, their antibody titers were very similar to the healthy controls. Uh, but if you were getting immunochemotherapy within six months of completing immunochemotherapy, uh, there was really significantly reduced antibody titers. Uh, they had very few patients getting a benetuzumab, but it did look like that response or reduction in antibody titers persisted quite far. They had one patient that was 21 uh, months out from finishing a benetuzumab that still did not mount an antibody response. This is their um, kind of a snapshot of their functional T cell assays. And so what they had was um, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, pre-vaccination, and then post-vaccination. In pre-vaccination, there really, there was no stimulation of the T cells um, when uh, these T cells were um, subjugated to uh, COVID uh, peptides. Um, but in all patients, which was encouraging, they did see uh, signs of activation in the post-vaccination. And so this data suggested that these patients with Waldenstrom's and follicular lymphoma at least had some T cell um, uh, education with the vaccination. So just to kind of summarize uh, both the, the ASH presentations, but also kind of the, the, the growing um, uh, data on indolent lymphomas and CLL and, and COVID, is that patients with indolent lymphomas, particularly CLL, at baseline have lower humoral response to COVID vaccinations compared to healthy controls. Uh, despite, I think, limited and relatively mixed T-cell uh, data, there really is very little downside of giving our patients vaccinations. Um, and so all vaccine, all unvaccinated patients that come through your office with these diseases need to be counseled every time you see them to really educate them, to try to get them vaccinated. And then even in those that are vaccinated, the vaccine itself may actually not be producing a huge amount of protection. And so um, having discussions about uh, precautions and having discussions about uh, use of prophylaxis, including Evusheld. So if you're here at Yale, we have this Evusheld COVID prophylaxis panel order set uh, that is quite helpful and will uh, kind of walk you through uh, getting uh, Evusheld to our patients. I also think it's important to recognize that treatments used for our diseases, CLL and nidal lymphomas, uh, likely have differential impact on humoral response to COVID vaccinations. Uh, not surprisingly, anti-CD20 um, can really uh, lead to low uh, antibody titers after vaccination for six, 12, perhaps even longer, um, and is important to, to kind of think about. And then also maybe more surprising was the use of BTK. So people in BTK seem to have lower responses to COVID vaccinations as well.
And so because of this, all of our patients with CLL and lymphomas really need to be educated about early identification of COVID illness, as well as um, perhaps using outpatient treatment strategies, monoclonal antibodies, antivirals. I think actually that is a key um, takeaway for uh, managing patients with, with CLL and lymphomas these days. So there's going to be a couple studies, hopefully reading out this later this year, uh, that will help give us a little more information about our patients that are immunosuppressed. The Melody study is a mass evaluation of lateral flow immunoassays and detecting antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. Um, and this is a large community-based study in the UK, so about 35,000 patients were um, enrolled. And they're going to be looking at antibody response to three and four doses of mRNA vaccine. And then really importantly, they're going to look at whether the lack of antibody response correlates with the risk of COVID-19 infection as well as severity of disease. Uh, there's also an important study for our patients with CLR and BTKs, which published our DECA study. This is out of Australia, where they're basically um, going to uh, stop patients on their BTK temporarily, vaccinate them with different strategies in terms of holding the BTK, um, ideally to identify ways of, of uh, allowing our BTK patients to mount a, a nice antibody response following vaccination to, against COVID. So given this uncertainty, given the fact that our patients typically do very well um, with uh, current modern therapeutics, I've generally recommended fixed duration without maintenance for most of my patients. And so when we think about fixed duration, lack of maintenance, was there any studies at ASH that might uh, influence our therapies going forward? And there certainly were, and I'll focus on those in the next few slides. So this was an important study uh, presented by Dr. Eichhorst, which is a CLL-13 study. Um, this was a large randomized European uh, study where patients without deletion 17P, uh, without um, uh, TP53 mutations were randomized either to standard immunochemotherapy, FCR, BR, or rituximab, venetoclax, uh, venetuzumab, venetoclax, or the triplet, venetoclax, abrutinib, and, and uh, venetuzumab. Standard dosing, so patients got six months of the anti-CD20s, they got 12 cycles of venetoclax, and then for abrutinib, if people were still MRD positive, people could get up to 36 cycles. So the primary outcome was, it was uh, two um, co-primary outcomes, MRD undetectable rate at 15 months, as well as PFS. Um, not surprisingly with this uh, kind of early follow-up, the PFS has interim assessment hasn't been reached, and so that's still to come, but they did have the 15-month uh, MRD data that they presented at ASH. And um, what we see here is that the peripheral blood flow cytometry-based undetectable MRD um, was 86% in the GVEN arm and 92.2% in the triplet arm. Uh, both the chemotherapy as well as rituximab venetoclax had lowered around 50%. Um, and overall, this, uh, there was two positive arms compared to the immunochemotherapy, both the GVEN and uh, G-abrutinib venetoclax. There was a kind of companion MRD assessment uh, presentation, uh, which I think was, was, was quite interesting, where they looked at MRD by the CLL molecular phenotype. Or, um, and what we can see here is that the... Um, molecular subtypes of CLL that typically do much better with abrutinib compared to immunochemotherapy uh, do uh, better on the triplet arm. So patients that are 11Q, uh, patients that are unmutated, um, have at least kind of a 10, 10 absolute percent increase of MRD undetectable with the triplet compared to the doublet arm. Patients that have the lower risk disease in terms of being uh, IGHV mutated um, seem to have relatively similar MRD rates, um, whether you get the doublet or the triplet. This MRD does come at some toxicity in terms of the triplet arm compared to the doublet. And so things like febrineutropenia infections were higher in the triplet compared to the doublets. Um, and then when you add a brute nib, you also saw uh, a low rate, although it was there at 2% in terms of AFib. So in terms of the summary and takeaway was that in terms of MRD uh, status, uh, the abinituzin and venetoclex uh, were superior to chemotherapy. Um, and there was two arms that met their uh, co-primary endpoint. Uh, rituximab venetoclax uh, was not superior in terms of MRD undetectable rate compared to a primary FCR uh, chemotherapy arm. They were very happy to see that most patients tolerated treatment well. There was very low rates of discontinuation. And um, although there was uh, some increased, uh, perhaps, toxicity for the triplet in terms of infection, in terms of febrile and generally people tolerated this, this regimen well.
So if we think about kind of the majority of our patients are older, um, perhaps have comorbidities, maybe the triplet um, uh, is, uh, is, is not uh, appropriate for that patient population. Um, is there another fixed duration regimen that we might be able to use in the near future? And there is, this is the GLOW study. Um, and this was a randomized trial of um, patients uh, that were older um, or those that were younger with comorbidities. Um, about 210 patients or so were randomized to either a benetuzumab, or, uh, I take that back, they're a brutinib, so a brutinib lead in for three months, and then a brutinib venetoclax for twice cycles, and then everyone stopped. It was not MRD um, directed therapy. And then the old control arm here is a benetuzumab with carambosil. This is the PFS data. This data has been presented earlier at EHA, and what the focus of this abstract was was really on the MRD uh, rates in this in this uh, arms. So we can see ser certainly uh, clear superiority in that PFS benefit of the uh, abrutinib venetoclax arm compared to clonibusil benetuzumab, with a median follow-up of, of 34 months. Although overall survival was actually identical, um, and uh, it'll be important to see the long-term follow-up from this, this study as well. Um, the, instead of being flow, they used NGS, a little bit more sensitive um, and a little bit more reproducible. And what we see here is that the rates of MRD and detectable with this doublet, uh, oral doublet, was about 50% in the peripheral blood as well as the bone marrow. Um, and uh, that was uh, statistically significantly improved over carnibacil and venetuzumab. It's also notable that the concordance of bone marrow to uh, peripheral blood uh, MRD was much higher in the doublet arm compared to the immunochemotherapy of carnibacil venetuzumab. Um, for patients that I think are thinking about PFS and how long they're going to be in remission af after stopping treatment, I think this was a really important uh, key uh, addition of the study, which was everyone stopped um, a, a therapy um, and at, certainly at about 30, 30 months of follow-up here. You can see that patients that were still MRD detectable at the time of, of stopping therapy maintained uh, a response without progression. And so this was, I think, important finding uh, moving forward. And together with the GLOW study, uh, as well as other phase two studies, Captivate, for instance, um, it's possible that we'll see uh, additional labels of uh, doublet or all oral doublet later this year. And I would stay tuned uh, to see whether that could be incorporated into standard practice. So when we think about follicular lymphoma and fixed duration, we're really uh, uh, more thinking about the anti-CD20 in terms of maintenance uh, rituximab. Um, and this was an important update from Dr. Call from Washington. St. Louis of the resort study. So this was a randomized study done here in the United States. Patients had low burden of follicular lymphoma. They all received four weekly doses of rituximab, and then they were randomized if patients um, had a stable disease um, or better. And patients either got rituximab monotherapy every three months uh, indefinitely until progression, or they were on active surveillance with retreatment with rituximab, uh, and this was a one-to-one -one randomization. This data was originally published in JCO in 2014, and the conclusions are here, where basically rituximab for treatment was as effective as maintenance rituximab for treatment failure. Um, however, the maintenance rituximab did uh, delay time to needing cytotoxic chemo. Um, and ultimately, as you might expect, there was more rituximab used in the maintenance compared to the retreatment arm. Um, a year later, they followed up on quality of life, and there was really no difference between the maintenance rituximab arm compared to the retreatment. And based off of this kind of earlier follow-up, um, Dr. Call and his colleagues recommended that uh, retreatment rather than maintenance or tuximab was the preferred strategy. So now at around 10 years of follow-up, do we have any different uh, signals here? And so this was uh, freedom from first cytotoxic chemo. And with long-term follow-up, we still see a, a separation of the curves between rituximab maintenance continuously compared to the retreatment strategy. You also see improved duration of response. And so 66% of patients treated with maintenance or tuximab um, do not have progression co compared to just 30% of patients uh, treated with four doses of rituximab actually. So um, much lower, obviously, uh, need of rituximab for, in, in, in administration of rituximab for the retreatment arm. And then importantly, despite improvements and in, in, uh, time to cytotoxic chemo, the, the main kind of takeaway was that overall survival, um, transformation risk, secondary malignancy seemed very similar between the arms. <laughs> 
And so the long-term follow-up conclusions really didn't change from Dr. Call's uh, mind. Um, he, you know, it is true that time to cytotoxic therapy uh, was improved with maintenance rituximab, but the glass was kind of half, half full in the sense that 63% of patients treated with retreatment uh, remained chemo-free at seven years. Uh, the duration of response was certainly better with maintenance rituximab, but he'd argued that 30% of patients received just four doses of rituximab and never needed treatment again for 10 plus years. And because the overall survival benefit was identical, um, the treatment, the rituximab retreatment strategy rather than maintenance uh, remained uh, the recommendation of these investigators. So where do we stand in the spring of 2022? Um, we have wonderful therapies for, for patients with CLL and endolent non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And um, we have to recognize that uh, our therapies, although they're wonderful, are not curative. Uh, patients typically derive um, you know, decade plus long benefits. And historically, there's been poor correlation of first line PFS with overall survival, meaning that we can, we can salvage our patients if they relapse. Um, and because of that, must, much of my focus has been mainly maintaining good quality of life and, and safety in the era of COVID. And what that really means is that active surveillance um, and remains the, the standard of care for those that don't have clear indications for lymphoma-directed treatment. It means educating patients really ad nauseum about vaccinations and early COVID testing, as well as therapeutics. And then it means if, if we do need treatment, which certainly some do, um, shifting more towards the fixed duration therapies. Ultimately, as we move forward, uh, I think MRD is an important outcome, but I also think that things like immune reconstitution, quality of life, and non lymphoma related mortality will be really important key metrics uh, as we look at the future uh, readouts of clinical trials. And so with that, I will move um, over to Dr. Kathari, who will uh, lead us in our presentation of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and mantle cell lymphoma. Thank you, uh, Scott. Um, so I'm going to present on <clears throat> DLBCL and mantle cell lymphoma as 2021 highlights. And uh, for DLBCL, I would like to focus on two frontline uh, studies, uh, one being Polarix, which has been hotly debated and discussed in various forums after it was presented as a late breaking abstract. Um, and then uh, use of high dose methotrexate to reduce CNS relapse. Um, which was a big uh, retrospective analysis um, that we'll discuss. In mental cell lymphoma, I'll discuss um, the frontline uh, long-term data on MCL1 younger trial, which, is, which uses high-dose cytarabine containing regimens um, uh, in, compared to RCHOP. And then in maintenance setting, uh, use of R squared, which is lenalidomide with rituximab versus rituximab after uh, first line in elderly patients. And then in relapse refractory setting, glufitamab, which is a uh, bite, a bispecific T-cell engager after BTKI failure. Here are my disclosures. So um, this was probably one of the most exciting uh, trials that were um, uh, uh, you know, discussed and presented at ASH 2021 which potentially changes our, uh, our frontline uh, care in DLBCL, and hence I would like to discuss this. So this uh, polartuzumab vidotin is an antibody drug conjugate uh, which targets CD79B um, uh, and eventually leads to a microtubule disruption uh, and apoptosis. Um, and you know, it, was, uh, it has been extensively studied and now approved in combination with bendamustin rituximab uh, in the relapsed refractory setting. So the researchers here uh, studied um, uh, patients who were previously untreated, uh, had a previously untreated DLBCL, age 18 to 8 years, IPI score of 2 to 5, uh, ECOG 0 to 2, um, uh, with stratification factors as mentioned here, um, randomized 1 to 1 between POLA R chip versus R chop. So when Christine was swapped with uh, polatuzumab vidotin. Um, and it's important to note that it is a randomized double-blinded study. So the investigators or patients had no, uh, did not know what therapy they were receiving. Um, uh, and this was followed by two cycles of rituximab. This was mainly to satisfy European regulatory requirements uh, as eight cycles of therapy is a standard uh, in Europe. Um, the primary endpoint was progression-free survival, which was investigator assessed. Secondary endpoints are listed here. 
Uh, these were the demographic and clinical characteristics at baseline. So, um, you know, it's very well balanced. Um, important things to note here are uh, there were 10% of patients with early stage disease and 90% uh, with stage three or four disease. And um, IPI score of two was in approximately 38% of patients versus 62% were three to five. Um, and it was well balanced between uh, ABC and uh, GCB subtype. Interestingly, uh, there were double expressive lymphomas quite heavily represented, 38% uh, versus 41%, um, and uh, double hit lymphoma or triple hit lymphomas were 8% and 6% respectively. Um, so these are the uh, uh, curves, um, the number one being investigator assist, assessed progression free survival, which was the primary endpoint of this trial. Um, and the hazard ratio was of 0 0.73, not crossing one with p-value of 0 0.02, showing statistical significance uh, of polar R chip uh, in comparison to R chalk. Um, if, you, uh, if you see here the overall survival, then uh, you clearly, uh, there is no overall survival benefit at, at, uh, at the short-term uh, follow-up so far with a p-value of 0 0.75 and hazard ratio of 0 0.94. Um, interestingly, uh, this is a uh, assessment of patients who received subsequent treatments after this frontline therapy. And clearly, uh, if you count any modality of treatment, then our top uh, arm patients got substantially more 30% uh, of patients got uh, uh, received subsequent treatments versus only 22.5% in polar r -chip. Um, This is the subgroup analysis, and I would like to draw your attention, although would uh, you know caution in making any too strong of conclusions here, um, but um, uh, bulky disease, uh, if it was absent, polar r -chip showed more statistically significant uh, advantage, uh, ABC uh, uh, cell of origin, uh, you know, polar chip did better in that, and um, IPI score of three to five versus two, uh, polar chip seemed to do better in those subgroups. Common adverse events, this is, I think, a very important slide because um, this really tells us that the double-blinded portion of the study worked well because it's identical between polar chip and our chop, um, including peripheral neuropathy incidence. Um, there was a slight higher rate of uh, higher grade febrile neutropenia in polar R chip versus our chop, but the rest of the side effects are pretty comparable. So the way I see this trial is very nicely depicted in this figure from a cancer cell paper published recently um, by Dr. Chu um, is essentially uh, patients who are at, uh, have higher IPI score in the current setting, they would get our chop. And when they fail, they would be in this pool to get autologous stem cell transplant, or they would have failed and they would have gotten uh, salvage regimens. In the future, we would re-stratify them based on their IPI score. Uh, remember that two to five was the inclusion criteria. Subgroup was for the three to five, showing more advantage. But all uh, you know, the uh, inclusion criteria was two to five, um, and then you would basically give um, our chop in lower IPI score patients and polar chip in the higher ones, uh, and then uh, you would have less patients who would relapse. And the ones who would relapse, you have now options of autologous stem cell transplant if they have relapsed after 12 months or they have um, the achieved complete remission from salvage regimen um, or CAR T cell therapy. And if they fail, then to move on to salvage regimen. So this way, we hope that we have less patients in this pool uh, to treat. So my final thoughts on the Polex trial is that PFS benefit from a well-designed randomized control uh, trial is, uh, in this population is meaningful. Um, regulatory approval is pending currently. Um, uh, Long-term data will guide further use. Subgroup analysis is only hypothesis generating. No known biological rationale for higher responses in ABC, DLBCL is known so far. What will be the role of polituzumab vedotin in relapse refractory DLBCL? Uh, because we all use polar BR quite commonly in relapsed refractory setting um, as salvage, and that is going to 
<clears throat> become a problem once polartuzumab virotin moves frontline. The good news is that we have other approved therapies like tafalen and uh, longcastruximab. So uh, hopefully we'll have more approvals in the future um, and we can expand our relapse refractory repertoire. Um, while the differences are statistically and clinically meaningful, this is not a game changer. Um, other class of drugs like bites and CAR T cells should and are being studied in frontline, especially in high risk disease. Financial toxicity is real and should be discussed with patients on a case by case basis. Um, second is high dose methotrexate is not associated with reduction in CNS relapse in patients with aggressive B cell lymphoma. Um, an international retrospective study of 2,300 patients um, uh, presented by Dr. Lewis. So we know that CNS IPI score is helpful in knowing what kind of patients are going to have a CNS relapse at, or at a higher risk of a CNS relapse. But um, overall, uh, patients with those high risk features, they uh, fare poorly. Um, and um, much needs to be done uh, to prevent these relapses. So uh, uh, there is no consensus on what CNS-directed prophylactic therapy uh, should be given and how it should be incorporated into the systemic therapy backbone. <clears throat> Many centers, including Yale, we, we have used high-dose methotrexate, uh, which we hope uh, mitigates CNS risk based on some retrospective studies in the past. There is no prospective data to guide our treatment. So this eligibility criteria was patients with CNS IPI score of four to six, high-grade B cell lymphomas where we automatically give uh, CNS prophylaxis therapy, primary breast or testicular DLBCL uh, with the rest of the inclusion criteria shown here, um, including exclusion uh, in, uh, being CNS involvement by lymphoma at diagnosis. Um, 2,300 patients were enrolled um, and uh, uh, almost 2,000 to 1,800 patients did not get high-dose methotrexate versus 400 patients got high-dose methotrexate. And out of those patients who got high-dose methotrexate, CNS relapse was observed in 31 patients, uh, which is 8%. Um, just to draw um, your um, attention to uh, the fact that really it was, um, uh, you know, a percentage-wise well-balanced study, um, uh, including the ECOG and B symptoms and extranodal sites, which was of course heavy, uh, heavily represented in high-dose methotrexate group. Um, here, I would like to draw your attention to the high-risk extranodal sites. So clearly uh, we have more representation of those patients in the high-dose methotrexate group as we would have expected. Um, and in as you go higher up in the number of extranodal sites, you have higher representation in the high-dose methotrexate group as we would have expected. This, these are the results. So in all patients, cumulative incidence of CNS relapse was not statistically significant between these two groups. Um, uh, it was 9.2% in high-dose methotrexate group and 8.1% in, uh, in uh, the patients who did not get high-dose methotrexate. The similar results hold true for patients who achieved CR. So this is a subgroup analysis. Um, and this is the site of CNS relapse, which I thought was very interesting. So patients who did get high-dose methotrexate, they saw less of parenchymal relapse versus they saw higher leptomeningeal relapse. So that brings into question whether a dual strategy of high-dose methotrexate with intrathecal methotrexate would be appropriate, although there is no data uh, to support that. And then the group describes uh, multiple subgroup analyses based on number of external sites, specific external site involvement, CNS IPI score, um, and the dosage of high dose methotrexate, um, and so on and so forth. But none of these subgroup analyses showed any statistical or clinically meaningful difference between the two groups. So, in conclusion, in the largest study to date investigating efficacy of high-dose methotrexate um, uh, in reducing CNS relapse in high-risk patients, high-dose methotrexate was not associated with reduction in CNS relapse in overall for patients within CR or in any high-risk subgroup. <clears throat>
Um, next, I would like to move to mental cell lymphoma um, and uh, discuss addition of high-dose cytarabine to immunochemotherapy before autologous stem cell transplantation in patients aged 65 years or younger with MCL, uh, known as the MCL1 younger study. Um, 497 patients were randomized between control, which was RCHOP, uh, and experimental group being RCHOP alternating with RDHAB, which can, contains cytarabine. Um, <clears throat> the results in uh, which were initially, first results published in 2016 are shown here, which I'm going to skip over. Um, the updated results uh, of, from 2021 are shown here. So you see that there is significant difference between the cytarabine containing regimen um, versus our CHOP with time to treatment failure, um, 8.4 years in our DHAP arm versus our four years in our CHOP. Um, similar uh, results hold true for in PFS, um, looking at um, uh, from randomization, from end of induction, and from autologous stem cell transplant. Um, and, um, you know, this is very striking uh, to note that um, eight years uh, was the median PFS in RCHOP RD HEP arm, which is uh, quite uh, uh, significant. Uh, overall survival, um, when you look at all comers uh, and intention to treat population, there was no statistically significant difference. Um, but if you stratify them by MIPI, uh, then there was statistically significant difference uh, with hazard ratio of 0.74, not crossing the midline. Um, and these are the high risk, high risk subgroup stratification curves of overall survival. So here you have high risk, uh, defined by high intermediate or high MIPI score, high, PI, high P53, by IHC or blastoid variant, um, and versus low risk, where you do, uh, have no uh, statistically significant difference between the two arms. So conclusions are that high dose cytarabine containing induction and autologous stem cell transplant achieve 60% 60% uh, survival at uh, 10 years with acceptable toxicity. Benefits of high dose cytarabine in high and low, low risk patients was observed. OS is significantly improved when adjusted to MIP or KI67. Open question still remains salvage treatment in RCHOP patients. Um, and avoidance of um, TBI may reduce rates of secondary malignancies in, uh, in both arms. Next, I will quickly discuss uh, rituximab lenalidomide maintenance uh, superior to rituximab maintenance after first line immunochemotherapy in MCL, which was the R squared uh, elderly M MCL clinical trial. Um, um, and uh, a, uh, another uh, uh, abstract from the same trial looking at MRD and its prognostic value uh, in the same trial. So this uh, trial randomized 620 patients between control uh, arm uh, where 312 patients got RCHOP versus cytarabine containing regimen, which in, uh, incorporated RCHOP alternating with high dose cytarabine. Um, and then there was second randomization for patients who achieved a CR um, uh, between R and R squared maintenance. So uh, I'm not gonna go over these uh, patient characteristics. They are well balanced in both the uh, arms. Um, and same thing holds true for the maintenance arm as well. Um, these were the safety uh, profile differences, quite significant uh, blood and lymphatic system disorders were observed in R squared uh, versus R um, and uh, uh, not unexpectedly higher grades of neutropenia, anemia and infections were observed in the R squared arm. Um, th these are the PFS and OS curves. There was no OS difference between the two, while there was a higher PFS uh, benefit in the R squared arm. What I found most interesting was the MRD analysis on, in, on this set of patients, where we found uh, paradoxically improved PFS uh, in the R squared arm in MRD negative patients. Um, versus MRD positive. The difference is quite striking, 61% versus 84%. So the conclusions are, um, uh, I think, mainly that there is an MRD below the detection threshold of the currently used technique. 
Um, clearly, uh, since there was improvement in the experimental arm, which added lenalidomide in MRD negative patients. Um, so we have to take um, MRD studies uh, and you know, analyze them carefully before making uh, any big conclusions. Lastly, I would like to show a couple of slides on glofitimab, a step-up dosing um, in relapsed refractory mantle cell lymphoma who had failed prior BTKI therapy presented by Dr. Phillips. Um, glofitimab is a 20 uh, uh, CD3 bispecific antibody engager with two is to one configuration as shown here. Um, this was uh, done in combination with uh, obinutuzumab uh, either in as fixed dosing or step-up dosing. What I want to draw your attention to is most patients, 69% of patients um, had relapsed after BTKI uh, therapy. And many of these patients were refractory to uh, prior therapy, 90% of them, including refractory to first-line therapy uh, in half of the patients. Serious uh, adverse events were observed in, in this uh, uh, small study, um, including 62% of patients, um, most of them being related to glufitimab, but important to note that no adverse events leading to treatment discontinuation were reported. Um, and these are the adverse events, uh, uh, cytokine release syndrome being the most common one. This is why I uh, thought of presenting this trial here. Um, very high uh, CR rates and uh, ORR rates, so 67% in all patients, um, uh, CR versus 81% uh, overall response rate, um, especially in patients who have received uh, prior BTKI therapy. So we believe that uh, uh, bi-specific bi uh, bi T-cell engagers are going to play an important role in refractory mental cell lymphoma in the future. Thank you. And I'll pass on to Dr. Tharshin Sethi, uh, who will present in Hodgkin lymphoma and T-cell lymphomas. Hi, everyone. While I'm trying to share my slides, um, thank you so much for joining us. All right, so um, I'm going to, I have no relevant disclosures. I'm going to start with Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, my intention is to do a very uh, broad overview of where the field is moving in both of these topics, uh, that is Hodgkin and uh, T-cell lymphomas. Um, so first uh, we'll start with some frontline trials in Hodgkin lymphoma, and then moving on to, to some relapsed refractory trials. I think it's just important to note that all of these are basically checkpoint therapy-based uh, studies that I, ha I have uh, included here. Um, uh, as you can see here, uh, you know, checkpoint inhibitor therapy is being brought into the front line uh, in Hodgkin lymphoma in the, in the hope of uh, improving um, long-term outcome while reducing toxicity. And then at the same time, you, we also have um, um, you know, relapsed refractory and key patients, especially the population that uh, relapses post autologous stem cell transplant. And there is a, a, a need for uh, uh, therapy in patients who uh, fail both brintaximab and checkpoint inhibition in that line. And so that's where uh, some of, most of these studies are. Uh, uh, that's the, uh, the, um, the therapeutic need that these studies are addressing. So first, the frontline, um, the study that I'd like to uh, mention is the, uh, by Dr. Allen at uh, Emory. And this was looking at single agent pembrolizumab followed by AVD for classical Hodgkin lymphoma. So this, uh, uh, pre this uh, particular presentation was an update from a prior uh, uh, ASH presentation where they had uh, presented the primary endpoint that is the complete metabolic response rate by PET-CT. Uh, initially. So the brief background of this study was that, um, uh, as we know, uh, 9P24.1 amplification is uh, common in patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. And so this uh, study by design was uh, uh, had the lead-in pembrolizumab primarily to be able to get some um, uh, correlative data for pembro alone in these patients um, and to be able to 
again, uh, uh, see what is it uh, that is uh, correlating with both response and uh, prognosis in these patients. Um, so this particular uh, abstract was presenting the secondary endpoints of uh, uh, updated PFS and uh, overall survival at around the 33 month follow-up, and then also further correlative studies. So this, um, as I mentioned, this was sequential PEMBRO followed by AVD. Um, the, um, uh, uh, after the initial PET scan, three cycles of uh, pembrolizumab was, were given, and then uh, the uh, second PET scan was obtained. Um, at this point of time, uh, the primary endpoint of complete of metabolic complete metabolic response was assessed, um, and then in addition, they uh, did um, correlative studies that included both immunohistochemistry as well as FISH 924.1 alterations. Then patients went on to receive AVD. Uh, so as you can see here, the median age um, uh, for this uh, patient cohort was uh, 29, uh, but they did include patients up to 77 years of uh, age and about 15% were elderly patients. Um, to, uh, they uh, enrolled a total of 30 patients and 60% uh, uh, were advanced stage Hodgkin and 40% uh, were early unfavorable Hodgkin. So uh, on the top uh, right of the uh, slide, you can see that uh, uh, the their uh, basically assessment of the complete metabolic response after three cycles of pembrolizumab. They defined a parameter called near complete medical resp uh, complete metabolic response, um, which was defined as more than 90% in metabolically active tumor volume. And they found that uh, nearly uh, that CR along with near CR uh, was seen in about 63% of patients by PEMBRO alone in the front line. Um, and the remaining patients had a uh, uh, partial response. In addition, they also looked at, uh, 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 at this time they reported uh, updated PFS and overall survival uh, data which uh, showed 100% um, progression-free survival as well as overall survival at a median follow-up of, of 33 months. In addition, they, this study was very well designed in terms of uh, correlatives uh, after the lead-in pembrolizumab, and they noted um, that um, alterations of 9P24.1, uh, which they defined as either disomy, polysomy, copy number grain, or uh, amplification, was present in one, some one way, uh, form or the other in all of the patients. That's 100% of the patients that they had tissue on, which was uh, 28 out of the 30 patients. And um, uh, in looking at uh, more uh, the immunohistochemistry, they calculated an H score, which was uh, uh, combining the intensity and uh, intensity of PDL1 uh, staining along with uh, the percentage of cells that were positive. And uh, they uh, compared both of these uh, to the response uh, to resp between responders and non-responders, and they did not find any correlation between PD1 pathway markers in response. So, um, in conclusion, uh, this uh, uh, was a pretty well-tolerated regimen where uh, no additional uh, signal of safety was seen, and. Um, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they looked at uh, uh, long-term in the 33-month uh, overall survival and PFS, which was both uh, 100%. So it was fairly um, um, effective regimen. And along with that, uh, they did not find any correlation between the PD-1 pathway markers and the depth of response. So they basically, they, were, uh, they implied that um, you could see favorable responses in, even in patients who had low PD-L1 uh, positivity. This um, uh, combination is now, now going to be studied in a phase three trial. And uh, again, one of the active um, combinations in frontline using checkpoint inhibition. I'm only going to briefly going to go through the concurrent PEMBRO and AVD data. Again, this was frontline here. There was no lead in and this, um, this was basically uh, both the uh, drugs were given concurrently. And uh, one difference between the prior study and this was that this was primarily a safety signal study. Um, that was the primary endpoint. And then the, the secondary endpoint was the CR rate. 
Um, so in this particular um, uh, study, they assessed response after two cycles of Pembro given concurrently with AVD. And then uh, depending upon the stage, because this uh, uh, study included patients through all stages. If you look at the patient characteristics, it included uh, patients that were uh, sta as, a, as early as stage one to stage two, stage four. So the total number of cycles really depend, uh, depended on what the stage was. Uh, but since their primary endpoint was safety after two cycles, they um, and uh, the main secondary endpoint was uh, response after two cycles, uh, that uh, uh, so th that was assessed basically regardless of the total number of cycles. Um, so uh, since the primary endpoint was safety, they uh, showed that uh, the main uh, uh, non hematological side effects um, that were grade, grade three or four, they were um, uh, very minimal. And in terms of immune related side effects, uh, they had um, uh, grade three, four transaminitis. Specifically, the, uh, the one patient with grade four transaminitis, they had a concurrent use of over the counter CBD oil, it appears like. Uh, so they, uh, it was, they were not sure whether it was truly drug related versus um, related to this uh, CBD oil use. But, um, and then there were a few patients, uh, three patients with grade three uh, transaminitis, and all of those cases were reversible. So, Overall, this regimen was thought to be well tolerated um, uh, in, uh, when the, the two, uh, when immune checkpoint inhibitor and chemotherapy was given concurrently. Um, their PET2CR rate, which was the secondary endpoint, was 66% uh, in all patients. And the overall response rate was 100%. Um, they reported a, a median follow at a median follow up of 16.2 months. They reported a PFS and overall survival uh, of uh, 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 so, uh, basically the median was not reached, and uh, uh, the uh, one year overall survival was 100 percent. One year PFS was 96 percent. I think one important thing uh, that is important uh, that is key to both of these studies in the front line is that uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor use uh, can result in uh, so PET scans can not, are probably not as uh, it's not as straightforward how to uh, you know interpret uh, PET scans in the setting of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, and so it may, would make sense to look at uh, novel things uh, like there is there are the lyric criteria for pet cd um, in patients with immune checkpoint inhibitor um, uh, dr allen study looked at um, uh, uh, total metabolic tumor volume and this particular study looked at uh, circulating tumor dna and um, the reported cases where uh, the uh, circulating tumor dna was both more sensitive and specific measure of residual disease rather than pet cd so uh, in conclusion, this was a, a safe and effective regimen, again, given in concurrently in the front line. And um, again, one of the ways that uh, we, we see um, checkpoint inhibition being incorporated into the front line in Hodgkin's. Okay, so I'm going to um, quickly go through three relapse refractory studies that are looking at uh, checkpoint inhibition combinations in uh, relapsed refractory Hodgkin lymphoma. The first of this is using ruxolitinib, the JAK2 inhibitor. And this is based on the rationale that 9P2 4.1 uh, amplification results in amplification not only of the PDL1, PDL2 pathway, but also of JAK2. And um, uh, uh, so that was uh, part of the rationale. And uh, uh, so they used uh, a combination of uh, nivolumab, uh, with ruxolitinib, and they did a three dose a tested three dose levels of ruxolitinib. Um, again, this was uh, the patient population here was checkpoint inhibitor refractory, so they the patient had already progressed on a checkpoint inhibitor single agent therapy before. So the median age uh, of all patients was thirty eight years, and um, forty two percent of the patients had had. Uh, prior 
uh, autologous stem cell transplant. So here they saw, uh, uh, they reported a complete, uh, an overall response rate of 48% and a CR rate of 24%. The total uh, duration of response, you can see here that there were um, several patients that were still um, um, had continued response, especially um, uh, 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 so, uh, especially those who had complete response with this uh, combination. Sorry. So, um, uh, as you can see here, the uh, they reported the PFS and OS at two years. It was uh, which was were. 46% and 87% respectively in this uh, multiple refractory population. Most uh, side effects were grade one and two and primarily consisted of hematological side effects as well as GI side effects. And the immune related side effects that were seen were mostly hepatitis and pneumonitis and all these were reversible. So, um, in the correlative studies, they looked at MDSCs after ruxolitinib, and uh, they found that there was decreased expression of MDSCs um, uh, with the use of this combination. So overall, this was again found to be a safe uh, uh, combination in a multiplicity refractory population, inclu uh, including basically all patients who are checkpoint in a beta refractory. So I'm going to pause here because um, in the interest of time and Hi. we're coming up to the hour and I know if people want to use their one o'clock to perhaps get outside and enjoy some of this nice weather. So um, there's two, I think, questions that I have. Um, and Dr. Napariti has the same one I had, which was uh, to Tarshin, in terms of frontline Hodgkin, um, you know, PFS, early overall survival for that, that one analysis um, for, out of Emory shows really great uh, with checkpoint AV, AVD, uh, but we also have good data on BV, AVD. How do, how do you think we move forward? Um, do we have a study for that? Um, where are we in, in terms of addressing that question? So I believe that uh, there is a, uh, there is a frontline study that is looking at uh, the, uh, the comparison between those two that can help answer that question. But at this point, it seems like, um, so as far as this particular study was concerned, Pembro followed by AVD, it did include uh, uh, bulky patients. What they found was that uh, most of the patients who had bulky disease uh, after three cycles of Pembro alone, they had um, a near complete metabolic response, not necessarily complete metabolic response. That was kind of one of the differentiating features in the, that particular study. But at the same time, when it comes to immunotherapy, it's very hard to interpret. Uh, a lot of the patients, um, like for example, even in the second study, the PET2 uh, positivity did not correlate with early relapse. So the it's not the same as what we see with non-immunotherapy. Uh, Therapeutic agents like um, you can uh, sometimes have long term responders even if they have initial pet positivity. So, and then I, I guess the question is is sequential versus concurrent? Do you think we need a, a, a trial, randomized trial, to really address the, the, the appropriate timing of checkpoint with AVD? I believe that uh, the second study, I think the first study was more the design was more to understand um, it was a few years, it was started a few years ago where we didn't know a lot about the correlative, uh, you know, uh, correlatives for this particular, for PEMRO alone and the efficacy of PEMRO alone. And that was the reason to do the lead-in rather than a safety measure. Uh, since the second study is already telling us that there is, it's safe to do the combination. I feel like um, similar to what we do with BV, like AAVD versus BV followed by AVD. I feel like both of those can be reasonable options, it seems like. That's helpful, thank you. And then the one thought I had before we open it up to the audience, if there's questions, please um, please send them in, was to Dr. Kathari in terms of um, the long-term data from Nordic and, and the study that you presented is anthracycline followed by HIDAC. Do, do you do that or do you um, use bendamustine with your induction? You know, how, do, how do you put that all together? 
Yeah, so there are multiple uh, backbones that, uh, that have been studied. Um, but I must admit that the most studied regimen uh, now with this data, especially with you know, high risk patients having overall survival benefit, um, would be RCHOP alternating with RDHAP. But you know, there's a Nordic regimen where you alternate RCHOP with high dose cytarabine, and then you have a you know, sort of um, a, more of a US regimen of Arbenda alternating with R-cytarabine. Again, these are all high doses. These uh, backbones have been studied um, uh, and compared with each other, but without the cytarabine part. So for example, our chop was compared with Arbenda. So we are extrapolating that, you know, Arbenda uh, is better than our chop and would be better even when combined with uh, high dose cytarabine. Of course, there are some early stage, you know, small patient series of prospective trials of doing, uh, of using Arbenda alternative with our high dose cytarabine. So overall, uh, to, to answer your question, there are multiple possibilities in frontline mantle cell lymphoma, and we really haven't established one standard of care like we have in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Um, and that's something that remains still a bit elusive as to what we'll, we'll all use. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's a good problem to have where, you know, you can really customize therapy based on the patient comorbidities and age and risk stratification. Thank you. Well, we're over the hour and I wanted to thank all the attendees for joining today. Um, feel free to email each of us if you have questions about uh, specific um, presentations we pres uh, you know, went over today, and how we interpret that and how we approach our patients. We'd be happy to to engage over that, uh, but enjoy your Friday and thanks for joining.